Welcome everyone to the Tile Roofing Industry Alliance training. Today is a short course and our guest speaker is Rick Olson, who is the Tile Roofing Industry Alliance President and Technical Director. My name is John Jensen and I am a roofing contractor from the Pacific Northwest. I also manage the training program for the Tile Roofing Industry Alliance. Lisa Jensen is also monitoring today, so if you have questions, you're able to submit those through your question feature on your computer, on your laptop. And again, our guest speaker today will be Rick Olson, and he is the Tile Roofing Industry Alliance President and Technical Director. I'm gonna tell you just a little bit about the Tile Roofing Industry Alliance. We are a resource for tile roofing professionals. Our manufacturers of clay and concrete tile are our primary members. Uh, we also provide a service through a search on our website for you, uh, for contractors, for manufacturers, suppliers, roof consultants, and for your consumers, people that want to find you uh, on our site through that search. The way you get onto that map and are located on that search is by completing one of our two training programs that are manual certifications. Our two installation guides are the regular manual, which covers 49 states, and also the Florida High Wind Manual. Taking those classes and passing a multiple choice test will qualify you to be in that search in the professional category that fits for you. In addition to those trainings, we also have a variety of short courses and other special classes to help keep up with any needs in the industry. Today is one of those short courses you can see uh, March 19th and going forward, we will always have at least one Florida High Wind and one regular manual certification on the calendar, in addition to the other short courses. In a couple of weeks, we'll have a uh, media professional that works for the Tile Roofing Industry Alliance who will be able to help you learn a little bit more about how to have your voice and your company seen on social media. So now I'm going to turn it over to Rick Olson and we look forward to learning a little bit more about the Tile Roofing Industry and he's going to address some of the more common questions uh, that we get from industry experts uh, first and then we'll open it up. So Rick, please take it away. So John and Lisa, thank you very much for doing the introduction and a special welcome to everybody that's taken time out of their day to hear a little more about the TRI. So first let's talk about what the TRI really is. And as John has in the slide up before you, we are the only association that represents all the manufacturers. So what does that mean? That means that we provide a resource to where we can gather and we can talk about those things that are important to our industry. Um, we can take a look at the issues and challenges that are common to each one of our players and start to find ways to address those. We've been in existence since 1971. We've uh, Tile obviously has been in the United States long before then, but really in the 70s was when a lot of the issues before the code bodies and before legislative actions and things dealing with natural perils uh, came to light. And it really set the stage for us to really make an effective trade association. So we're really, we're a coalition of manufacturers. And again, it is the only one that is out there for our members to be part of. But for us to call ourselves an alliance, we have to be more than just manufacturers. We make a cladding material that goes on a roof, but at the end of the day, it's part of a system. And within that system, we have the underlayments, we have all the accessories that go in part of the whole building assembly. And to do that and to really represent in an alliance standpoint, we need to have the contractors at the table. So right out of the chute, we started inviting some of the contractors that use our tile to be there. We also felt that if we got our suppliers and distributors on board, we would have a better understanding of all of those components that go within the system. Because at the end of the day, when somebody drives by a roof or somebody says, gosh, I'm happy with my roof or I'm unhappy with my roof, they never point to any other part or any other component in that roofing assembly. They'll go, there's another great tile roof, or gosh, there's a tile, my tile roof has not made me happy. So it's very important for us to work in tandem with all of these people to say at the end of the day, where would be the greatest resource or think tank dealing with tile roofing, and in particular, looking at the whole system. Now, at the end of the day, there are consultants and inspectors, and their job is to go out and to try and take a look at projects that are out there. 
their job is also to say, have we met with the intent and are we in compliance with the codes? Or in the unlikely case that there's been a problem out there, what is the problem? And how do we get to the root cause of the problem? Because the homeowner only knows they have a problem or the building owner, and they say we have a leak or gosh, we don't think this was done right. So for us, the only avenue we have to make our resources impactful is to make sure that we've got the whole supply chain. And the supply chain, as we say, is the contractors and all the way through to the consultants and the code officials. So when we talk about what, what's our main purpose? So when I get up every day, my job for our industry is to try and help position our tile products the most favorably we can in the market to the competing products, but also to make sure that we are constantly looking and reviewing to get the best practices. And so what we want to be able to do is build an awareness of what our tile roofs have and what are the benefits. You know, we get questions all the time is what is the benefits of tile in certain climates? And we have a tremendous story to tell. We're one of the oldest building materials in the world. And we have mass. There are people that say, well, your products are heavy, and they are heavy. But in reality, the heaviness brings a thermal mass to it that helps in the areas of energy by not letting that heat go through. And so when we start trying to quantify all of this, we've done the research. So we can say that as we build this awareness for our tiles, that we're doing it on sound science. It's not just marketing fluff that my dog's better than your dog, but in reality, we've gone out to say, what are our attributes as a product and as a system, and how do we quantify that, and how do we back it up with third party? We also say that we can supply technical expertise, and again, the technical expertise comes because our think tank has every possible person that's a stakeholder involved in it. So when we talk about that, we can go out and tell you about products and how they're made, as most trade associations would do, we can go deeper than that. We can bring to the table what contractors can do and what building officials like to see in play. And we can we work with the network of those that design our products so we can keep moving forward our vision and mission of meeting what are the, ex, the expectations of the homeowners We've seen over the last 15 years a huge transition in how buildings are designed. In the old days, you would have a simple gable roof, and now we have hip roofs. We have multiple planes. We have multiple products going in because the roof now becomes part of the experience of the house. So when you drive up in that driveway, you want to look and you want an experience. You want that feel good that what I have is the best and the latest and the greatest. And to do that, we have to constantly be changing what we do. We have to be constantly looking at what's available and, and what the codes are going to do and how we get better performance. And after every natural disaster, we've gone and taken a look and developed a learning curve from that. And then we implement that into our training to facilitate how we sell our products and how we get the code approvals going in place to back up everything we're doing. It's that unique expertise that everybody helps brings to the table that makes our alliance so powerful. So one of the questions we constantly get is on our manuals and why would we say our manuals are different than any other industry manuals? Well, when we look at what we did, we originally started out and said, gosh, we know that tile goes down in a lot of places, predominantly the Sun Belt, but one of the areas early on was the cold and snow regions that were out there. And we know from Europe, especially in the heavy, colder areas of Sweden and up in Germany and those areas where tiles have gone on forever, that tile actually does a better job than any other roofing product because if we can hold that snow on that roof, then in, in essence, it becomes an insulating barrier to what's going on. But there are things we needed to understand. So we went out and got some of the country's best known experts to help us write a snow and cold region manual. And then from that, we started saying, how do we get back into the rest of the culture? And when we look at the balance of the country, we sat down and said, we shouldn't do this alone. And we aligned with the Western States Roofing Contractors Association. We put together a manual. But our manual was no different than some of the manuals our individual members had. And at one point, there were 28 manuals that were out there by our players. And what we did is we sat down and said, our message is best taken. And the information we have and the ability to train and understand best practices would be if we could do a, sing, a single manual. And from that, we also said that building officials 
would like to be able to say, we want you to use the manufacturer's installation, but we have a problem with current ones that were out there that had so much permissive language or marketing fluff to it. So we sat down with a challenge of saying, could we do a prescriptive manual that at the end of the day would deal with the facts, would bring the science forward, would always take a look at compliance with the code, and then we had it reviewed. And at the end of the day, we became almost one of the first industries ever to take it to the code officials and carry a product approval specifically on our manual. Now, fast forward, Florida is a unique area, and for those of you on here today that may be in that area, you understand that the winds there are ongoing, and they're much higher than they are in other parts of the country. And there are practices in Florida that goes back decades, if not half a century, that were passed down from roofer to roofer to roofer. And there we had to develop in our own way a better way to look at this. And so we sat down and developed with the FRSA our Florida guides. Now, the Florida guide itself doesn't carry a product approval on the front because we went a step further in Florida where the Florida building code in and of itself is a prescriptive code. And so what we did is we've had the manual in each code cycle entered into the actual code. So different from the balance of the country, if you went to the International Code Council and you looked at the IBC or the IRC, it does not state our manual. Our manual is a standalone product approval, but in Florida, our manual is stated specifically in the codes. So that was kind of where we started of saying, let's all get on the same page. Let's all try and get our manuals to be what the manual should be. And that is that they're prescriptive, that they are sound science, that they reflect best practices by the contractors, and that they have enough detail so that it helps understand how the system and all the components within the system integrate. The question came up from one of the people on the call about technical bulletins and why we have them. Well, to us, there's three ways to do things. We can go out and we can put them in the code, which we do. A lot of the language around the wind and how we look at wind and what's called the um, air permeable principle that was based upon our 1988 wind study at the Redland Wind Center in France, where we went, took products over and in the UK, in London, there was a wind tunnel that could go above 130 miles an hour and we tested all of that. What we learned from that and the ability to design the airflow around tiles was important enough that we embedded it in the major codes. So that's one avenue to get our information out there. The next way to get our information out there is to be able to put it out and in fact, put it into our manuals. And as you know, and you can look at the dates on the front of the manuals, the manuals are not issued every year. The manuals in particular, at the start, we tried to follow code cycles. But in some cases, if the codes didn't have major changes between a three-year run, we would let them go. So for instance, we're still at the 2015 version of our moderate guide. The sixth edition of Florida came out because the new wind requirements require us to address ASC 716. And that just means that in the country, the American Society of Civil Engineers are the ones that dictate how wind is determined as other areas of cold, seismic. But in the area of wind, they looked at the wind tables, said we they felt from experience in the field that we needed to get better and have more safety factor built in. So they changed the prescriptive designs of what we had to do. They went from three roof areas to six roof areas. Florida was gonna adopt it, so we had to get the sixth edition out. We're currently looking at our manual right now, the main manual, and we will be updating that before June of this year to bring across that wind language. So we will see a new national manual, we call it, um, that will incorporate all of that into it. So after those two areas, then the question comes, how do we get other information out that's important? And when we talk important, it could be either clarifying what we already have in our manuals, or in fact, it could be addressing a new topic that's out there. So on our website, we put all of our technical bulletins that we put there, and currently we've had to reformat them to our new name change that are up there. And those are just there as a way for anybody within our system to understand what is something that has occurred that isn't in those other two areas. 
So for instance, the, the technical bulletin that we're looking at on this screenshot right now was one that we developed in 2017 about what tiles are available, i.e. which ones became discontinued. And we get a lot of questions about how did this come up? Well, in 2015 to 2017, there was a large change in the market and there was consolidation and that happens all the time. But in those years, it became very major as Borel and Monier actually had a 50-50 partnership and they merged it to where Borel took total control. And then within that, there had been the old, what was the pioneer that became Hansen that then rolled over and became Forterra that rolled over and became Headwaters and Borel acquired that entity. And at the tail end, they had, they had bought the Integra products. So at the end, we really have in Florida, three main tile producers. And with that consolidation, there were so many questions. We just asked our members, what do you currently have? What are you eliminating to get alignment? We reissued it again this year just to put it out there. It did not change. So once again, technical bulletins are a way for us to do it. And if you look on our website, there's 18 to 20 different technical bulletins that address everything from shipping tiles and what could occur to how to repair a tile to flashing issues um, to weather blocking to underlayments. So that's a quick way for us to address a problem that's brought from the community. And when we say community, it's all those people that are in our stakeholders realm to say, hey, we need better clarification of it. So once again, we're constantly trying to update those. You wanna stay current on those. The question comes, does a technical bulletin override what's in the manual? And the answer is in some cases it, it may. If we're doing one and we have the manual out, remember to get the manual reissued takes maybe a, a year through the process. If we need to quickly get information out or interpretation or something that's changed by the local code officials, we will do that through a technical bulletin, but we'll also send out to the community an email or we'll put it on any of our social medias out there or it'll be a banner on the front of our home page of our website that can deal with that. So those are the avenues that we go along. Now, some of you say, is that all the TRI does? Well, no, in fact, the TRI has a governmental arm. Now, some people would say, well, okay, why would you need a governmental arm? Well, we need a governmental arm because we need to have a presence. We need a presence in Washington, D.C., because the House and the Senate constantly put together legislation, and that legislation impacts building. It can impact energy efficiency, and minimum requirements, insurance coverage. And then beyond that, we have specific states that have things going on. For instance, in, in California, we're very active right now because there's a legislation trying to go through that on re-roof would require a white roof for all cases on steep slope. That's not something we know the industry wants, so we're very involved and created coalitions with other partners to be able to address that. In Florida right now, there is both work on the House and the Senate where they're trying to mitigate and reduce the amount of payouts being done after storms. And part of it is dealing with the legal fees and what insurance companies are able to do, but part of it has a segment in there where they wanna limit the actual cash value that is being allowed to be covered as a minimum that would affect and impact our tile products, but impacts all the other roofing products. So what we've done is build coalitions. I was on the phone just this morning with the head of ARMA and the Cedar Shake Bureau and the other interested parties, FRSA, the realtors, the home builders, where we're trying to put our coalitions power together and the unification of a voice. We have NRCA involved on many of the things that we do. So that our government arm is there for this strong purpose of trying to see how we can make the most powerful advocacy voice that we can in the protection of our products, our market, and the building in general. So with that, I think, John, we're ready to see if there are some uh, questions that you've gotten. Um, I'm happy to tell you there is our life in outer space. I, I don't know. 
Um, I think in COVID times, we're pretty safe because anybody looking would probably leave us alone. But leave us alone. Well, I've got a few that we've already had submitted. If anybody has additional questions, they can use the question feature on the on their computer. Uh, but we do have a couple, Rick. And uh, the first one is, why are there additional, you know, if it, we have our installation instructions essentially in our manual. Some of our manufacturers do have proprietary additional instructions. What's the value there? Well, the value there, um, John, and that's a great question. The idea is that as an industry, we look and say, what are the minimums we can put in place that would be representative to all of our stakeholders? And so when we look at that, um, it covers probably the 85% rule. But beyond that, some of our individual manufacturers make specific products. You know, you have a good examples of Ludoichi there, and Ludoichi have some products that, that are installed in a slightly different manner than traditional products would go down. Uh, likewise, Cedar Light and Madeira uh, were products that uh, Boral make that kind of are unique in how they go down. Um, some of the companies also have proprietary products or products that they have private labeled that, and accessories. And if you'll notice in our books, we don't cover a lot of accessories because that's a huge market and it's growing every day. And so what we try and do is say, if we could get everybody to go with the 85% rule and we could try and get all of that in our base manuals, then it allows the market and the individual manufacturers to say, well, here's some things that aren't in the manual and and this is how you might want to do that. For instance, the shingle tile installation that Ludoichi has, or by the way, you know, we have uh, training that we do that goes above and beyond just the basic minimums, but actually gets into upgraded systems. And we encourage that because in a lot of these markets, going to a slightly upgraded system is a great move to do. But again, our manuals have to be reflective of what is in the codes and what's compliant. And if, one, if manufacturers of our products or any of our associate suppliers have things that are upgrades um, in ventilation or flashing or any of the parts that are their batten systems, we leave that to the individual manufacturer because one, they it's their message. And second of all, they can change that message as they need probably faster than going through a process of getting it in their manual. But again, a great question, John. Thank you very much. The next one is about weather blocking. And the primary question is, is weather blocking required? It, it's used in in, uh, in all places now, but uh, a lot of questions go along with that. So I highlighted a few uh, details from this page of the manual to see what your comments might be on that. Yeah, so I, I think a great, great question. And it's one that comes up and it really got uh, pretty controversial when it first came out. Um, I think when we look at this, what we have to do is we have to say, why are we requiring a weather blocking? And I think when we go back to the basic thing, that if we look at it throughout Europe, where tile for centuries went down and it had no underlayment, it had no roof sheathing, it was what we call open space sheathing here. And that is you could go up in the attic and you'd look up and you'd see a one by four and the tile would be installed to that. And you're looking at the bottom of the tile. But in Europe, to be a master tiler, you have to be an apprentice for 18 years, pass testing, and then you become a craftsman, which they call a master tiler. And with that, you've you've put probably the best roofs on that can go down, and you've done it in such a way that there's never a problem of leakage. Here in the, in the U.S., it's still the same way. And when we look at what we're trying to do, if we can find ways to keep the tile on top or keep the water on top of the tile, then really we've done what the system is about because water just wants to find a way down. And what we found is in some areas of the country, as tile got going and obviously the S tile really gained speed and, and really was accepted. And for a lot of people, they feel that's the only tile we seem to make were commonly known as round, red and heavy, that we started looking, especially in Arizona and Nevada and in Texas that all of a sudden we're seeing all this S tile going up and we're seeing these gaps. And just from an aesthetic standpoint to look up and be able to see the ridge board or to be able to see stringers going up if it happens to be uh, uh, using a vertical stringer going there or just down at the eave these huge gaps where birds were nesting and everything else. The idea was that this isn't 
aesthetically looking right, nor is it probably good for the system, especially up on the ridge, if you had remotely any kind of wind-driven rain that it could occur up there, it's going to get under that system and run down the secondary barrier being the underlayment. And I know when we first launched and kicked this off as a requirement, I was asked to go down to Arizona and the roofing contractors were all lined up in a room and there were 65 of them in the room and they all were saying, you know, we're not going to be, we shouldn't have to do this, it never rains. Well, we just happened to luck out that on that night, five minutes into my talk, one of those little torrential downpours came down where we had about an inch of rain in about seven minutes. And I looked out the window and said, well, there goes the argument it never rains, but it just makes good sense. And so as we worked with the contractors, we found that the objection to doing it was just the builders didn't want to pay the extra cost to having it done. And then as we started down the path early on of saying, gosh, if we require the weather blocking, for sure we got to do it on an s tile because it's got huge gaps. But does it make sense on some of the other things we do? And are there certain areas of the roof where it can really help for the long-term performance? So that's where we started drilling down then in our next version of the manual and started looking at options on flat tiles and low profile tiles about what would be the minimum we'd like to see up there. And our committee at that time had probably 20 roofers that were involved in it. And that's where we started developing some of the language that's in there. And we tried to keep it as open to as many products possible. So that's why you see things in there that we still said that, you know, mortar could be allowed, a, a preformed plastic or self occurring flashing, you know, anything that would help um, make the thing work. Now, there are a lot of people that'll say, well, you know, is mortar the best answer? Is, you know, self adhering the best answer? There were a lot of different camps. There were contractors that swore that putting a number 11 trowel of mortar going down there would seal and bond it and make it work right. You know, we tried to identify some of the challenges of each of these systems and cement, as we know, has a different expansion contraction rate than, than the tile and the wood it would come that it doesn't come in contact with, but the paper sits over. So in essence, we started saying, we don't want to eliminate anything from it. We just want to bring attention. So when we look really at the, at the head wall um, going up there, you can see on the top, those are huge gaps. So we just said that we want those sealed. And when people come down with a roof to wall metal, which we got to have in there, and the idea is once again, water is trying to find the easiest path down. And all we're saying is if we can keep the, the water on top of that tile, or we can daylight it with a flashing all the way off of that roof, then we really are getting the best system long-term. So here's some great examples of, as time went on, some other products in the marketplace that have come out, you know, flexible products that have gone on there. And we try and never call them by brand names. And what we've watched is some of our members now are actually um, have suppliers lined up to do it, or they private label products that they're doing on there. But there's a whole market that's been created on the accessories that can deal with how we get by on these profile. We even say on a flat tile way up on the top when we start originally, is there something we could do there? And so you'll know even on the on the flat one we show up there that you could take 30 pound felt and you could run it up over the top and make it cover the nail hole on the other side. Now there's some arguing that 30 pound probably isn't a long-term answer, but if it's not exposed to the UV, then it shouldn't have a problem. And it was what all the roofing contractors said, okay, we could put some kind of metal there, but give us the option of using a true 30 pound paper, knowing that if we cut it off at the edge, that really the UV isn't gonna catch it and have exposure up there. We also know that in Florida and other parts, they use foam going across there to seal those off. Foam can't take the UV, so they said, fine, we'll paint it and avoid that from happening. So a great question, but if we think about it, all we're trying to say is, that for the aesthetic look and long-term performance, if there were to be any wind-driven rain that's going on there, let's go ahead and put some kind of flashing. Yeah, no, that's great. That for me as an installer of over 30 years, you know, when I look at the the slide that's up there now, it's it's kind of an evolution. You know, the old way was we had rigid steel flashing and the primary and and pretty much the only way we had to fill those gaps. 
and did fill them out in the field was with mortar. And today there are other products that are maybe speedier and, and some would say uh, with fewer callbacks. But I think the, the key for me is that the accessories as an installer, uh, every contractor in all of our training classes, our biggest challenge today is labor. And we've got a lot of accessories available in the marketplace that help us speed up. And so when we can do that and also avoid callbacks, uh, all the better. So the next one is about bird blocking, similar to weather blocking, but this is down at the eave. And in our manual, it says that it's uh, only required on high profile. And a very common question is, uh, you know, they make metal that fits the medium profile tiles, but we don't require that. Um, I have my reasons as an installer, but I'm curious what yours are, uh, Rick, as, uh, as one of the ones involved in writing the code in the manual. Well, it's a great question again, John. I mean, we have a great audience here today. They've they've come up with some uh, questions that really fall in line with what a lot of the the inquiries we get. So when we talk about the bird stop at the bottom, it really started uh, surfacing that down on that bottom edge that we needed to try and seal that off. And so when we started talking about weather blocking and and what was going on, it was about the same time that the uh, wildfire urban interface started coming up, the wooey things. And there was real concern from, especially in California when the fires were starting, that we had these big gaps down below. And once again, you know, birds were nesting and everything else. So predominantly we just said that we've got also, we've got to raise that first course up to have it ma match in the same roof slope as the other courses going on up the roof. Now you could put some kind of um, eave riser there, but the problem with doing all that is it was leaving these horrible gaps. So what we told the the fire code people, which if we understand California at all, California used to have its own building code, and what happened was there was quite a battle between ICC and the state fire marshal's office about who would dictate what's in it, and because of life and life and health safety issues, the floor, the legislature in California really turned the power over of the codes to the those with the focus and interest of the fire marshal's office. And so in working with them, they said, gosh, could you come up with a way that we require bird stop to start closing those gaps up down below? Uh, and we said, fine. And once again, here here's an area where we started out with mortar. Then in the, it, specifically in the clay, they had always made a bird stop that went in there. But on the concrete, then it started being, okay, what can we put across there? And lo and behold, as we all know, a problem and a solution drives innovation. And so now we have all kinds of eave riser metals that go and play down there that incorporate a profile to it. So it acts as a bird stop. In Florida, we've got them and they've got pinholes in them. So if water got underneath it, it could get the water off the system. Um, there are ones that are made with little vents in them to try and help increase that airflow because it's it drives the energy efficiency when we can get greater airflow. But a lot of the early stuff was driven purely by, we gotta close these gaps so we don't have fire issues. And so what we did is we said, look, we've gotta keep putting as many options on the table. So this is a great picture when we look at it. Um, in the book because it brings up all kinds of options that could be used up there. And we try and break it out so that people would understand. But the, the root of all of it was we needed to close up down at the eve of that roof. We needed to close that gap and try and make it. Now, the other question we get is, and I get calls all the time, gosh, I got bees under my tile. My bird stop didn't stop them. Or, you know, I, I'm getting insects under there. Well, the idea of what we're doing was to stop the big gaps, was to raise that first course up, was to put in something that would keep the bigger things in there, but we can't keep small things. It's just, you're never gonna be able to get the, the gap that tight. But that was the derivation and, and the thought um, along the lines of why we came up with it. Okay, thank you. And I'll say again, as an installer, for me personally, it's an advantage that we don't require it on medium profile. And the reason is that number one, I don't see a problem with birds. You know, obviously, as you mentioned, bees and smaller insects can get into a lot of crevices on any roofing material. But on the medium profile, which is, you know, a, a very uh, speedy roof to put down, it goes down very quickly. Uh, 
the ability to laterally move the tile remains if we have a level e riser metal. So I can adjust my tile after the e riser detail is installed. I can adjust it laterally to line up with a gable or a finishing gable or a large uh, dormer so that my I can minimize my cutting. Obviously, with a high-profile tile, we need to fill that cavity and those tile install vertically. But it's a real advantage to not have to do that in certain situations. Uh, and that, that small gap that's there is sometimes questioned. So it's good to know uh, those reasons. Yeah, um, and John, last, uh, John along those lines, uh, exactly was the, that was the feedback from the roofing contractors involved. We want always to have the greatest flexibility for materials and for installation practices so we don't lock things in because the other thing you get into is on an S tile and you're going to put in a bird stop, you're going to put in a metal. That metal has to be specifically for that tile. So you, you're going to have to put a, a tile design, let's say for a, an Eagle or a Boral or, you know, a Ludowich or an MCA or a Redland. Those are going to have to be able to fit the profile of the product you're putting down. Um, so we have that. The other thing is that in some parts where they use the mortar, we had to work with the mortar people and come up with a non-shrinking mortar so that you wouldn't have them shrink and then the bird stop that you put in is like a little spaghetti ball weren't falling out. So once again, we're trying to keep the most flexibility in what we do, but get it to perform long term. That makes great sense. Okay, the last question we had uh, pre-submitted is about underlayment. And, you know, we've got the synthetics in the market and we've got our basic ASTM standards in the manual. Rick, could you just go over those basics? I've got a couple of labels from product up there that maybe you can talk about. Well, it's a, it's a great question. It's probably one of the, the most controversial discussions that are going in the marketplace today. And that is for the longest time, everything was the Xerox, shall we call it, underlayments were the organic underlayments. And they were the traditional 30 pound underlayment. And what happened along the way is, as, as markets do, everything was called a 30 pound. And the understanding back then was that a 30 pound was a 30 pound. It had X amount of things put in there that was a recipe that would make it be in compliance with performance. And what happened is then we started seeing a migration away from that. And that was as other products were imported or people started taking products used for other things and trying to adopt it over as an underlayment, there became issues. And so when we sat down with our first manual, we just said, okay, we need a recipe here. We have to be pretty prescriptive. So we said, if we took a look at those that are performing out there, and we don't, we try and not mention names of products, but we took the mainstay products and we looked and said, this is what we want, what meets it. So then came up the ASTM standard that we could point to that was the D226 type two. And in that, if you look at it, it, it speaks specifically to how much organic material has to be in there, how much oil has to be in there. Here are the performance requirements it has to meet. So we put that out there and immediately we got pushback because the previous year, all of a sudden type 30 started um, being used a lot of different places. And so what we said is, no, we will, we've worked with our contractor base and we've worked with our code space and we're going to require a minimum of the ASTM D226 type two. And so that brought an awareness out there and literally we started seeing products out there in the year we were putting this out that should be 30 pounds and they were getting all the way down to 18 pounds. So once again, without a minimum standard to hold everybody to, it just opened up the products. So it's kind of interesting that you've picked these two up here, John, because we then said, um, as we worked with the ASTM standards, that the ASTM D226 type two was out there. And then within the committee of ASTM D08, which sits over all the standards, and this is a D standard, they started looking saying, well, you know, we want to get a broader base to what's out there. So they created the standard 4869. And within that, they have, you know, from type one to type four. And the parallel for what we needed was a type four. So we just said, great, if you're going to go to that, perfect. Their thought down the road might be that they would have 
go to the D4869 and eventually eliminate the D226 because 4869 covered a, a greater gambit of products. That never has happened to date, but that's okay. We still have had both on there. So now the question becomes, can a product meet just the 4869 on its label, or does it have to meet both? And for us, it has to be one or the other. But here's the interesting one, because people point to the upper one, and we see that on projects, and then it says it's an ASTM D4869. The only problem is if you look really close, as John's highlighted here, it's a type two. And a type two isn't a type four. And so therefore it isn't gonna have the same amount of, of materials in it. It isn't gonna meet the same performance standards that it needs to meet to be a type four. So it would not be allowed. And we see projects where this occurs. Now, likewise, about 10 years ago, synthetics started coming to town and the synthetics were lighter weight, they were cheaper, and so they started to enter the market as an alternative. And the code officials didn't know quite what to do it, but if the manufacturers were saying that our synthetic is the same as the D226, there were projects that started using them, and then it took off overnight. It almost became explosive in the marketplace. And then everybody started getting into the game because it was driven by the cost. And as builders say, look, I need to cut and shave every cost we can. Let's start looking at these as an alternative product. We started first looking at it when there was maybe a handful of products. And we looked with an engineer and said, all right, we need to understand these because they're showing up in our projects. And we're having people call up to say, can I use a synthetic underlayment underneath our tiles? And we didn't have an answer. And the more we started digging into it, the faster products started showing up, everything from house wraps to products made in other parts of the world that are being brought over here and trying to be marketed that they are equal to. And there was no industry association for underlayments. And at one point there were over 85 different synthetics that were out there and there was no understanding about the long-term performance. There is now a synthetic underlayment institute that's starting to look at it and try and develop a set of standards. But one of our big concerns out there when we look at it and it shows up on a project is we tell people that they need to be looking carefully at what the product approval is, if it even has one. Right now in the codes, they're trying to develop an acceptance criteria for synthetics as a standalone criteria but what's happened to date is there are so many that have gone out and picked a paragraph out of 4869 or a paragraph out of D226 or out of the 1970, which is the self-adhering underlayment, and they're saying we're in compliance with, but you gotta look at what comes after that because oftentimes they say I'm in compliance with 4869 subsection three or some specific paragraph or maybe one or two of the properties. To date, there are a few products that have gained the ICC product approval through the acceptance criteria process. So it's one of those ones where we're trying to work with people to say, look, if you're gonna use a synthetic or if synthetics are gonna be allowed, then you need to work with that manufacturer and ensure that what they have there actually is a code compliant product. We found about five years ago, there were tremendous failures of these in certain parts of the country because they weren't designed even for short-term exposure to UV. There are some that um, are not designed to hold water from going through them. There are some that if you put a nail hole in them, they start unwinding and unthreading. So there's really a lot of complexities that are brought to the table. And to date, we are saying these are our requirements. If you want to go with a synthetic, you really are going to have to sit down and work with that manufacturer and the local code officials and determine what they will allow. But that's a great question, John. Very good. Well, thank you, Rick. I have one more question to kind of wrap up and, and ha let you talk a little bit about the trends, because as you know, uh, we, had, we had one more question about this. And as you know, we're building and we're going with a, a fairly modern looking home with a couple of monoslope roofs, roofs and we're going to have a low profile tile. And uh, I know you're very aware of what those trends are, but can you just speak to some of the changes uh, in in uh, the preferences that the consumers are having right now? Yeah, I'm happy to do that, John. Good question. 
So what we see is builders generally hire design consultants and the design consultants help them figure out where market trends are going. And as I alluded to a little bit earlier that originally tile is thought of as being round, red and heavy and that it's really just a Southwest style, uh, Spanish style that everybody was on, but that's not true. If you go to Europe and other parts of the world, flat profile is really taking um, the majority of the market out there. S tiles really aren't sold in a lot of those parts of the world. But here in the US, when we look at different areas, I'm up here in the Northwest and in the Northwest, we either want a flat tile or a very low uh, profile tile under the medium profile, let's call it. We wanna hold it closer to the ground. It just has a better look. It blends in a little better. But what we really are starting to see is really the complexity of the roof design. So for people like you, John, that are trying to do this as a contractor, it's really had to raise the standard for having knowledge of how to properly put this down. We're starting to see huge interface of, you know, like I say, in the old days, when we did a straight gabled, you had one rough plane. And we're seeing complexities up of eight, 10, 12 different rough planes as people kick dormers out or they want split levels or they're adding on above garage and they just want this look of a three-tiered roof going up. So it's creating a lot of additional need for us to look at how we flash these and how we interplay with them. The other thing we're starting to see is a huge influx in the number of homes being built that want to integrate solar into them. As we look at the millennials, the millennials are going to do things that save the environment. So they want environmentally friendly products. They want, they're very knowledgeable on trying to say as we look long terms that we want a product that'll stay on there that is good for the environment, that's energy efficient, that I can put solar on. So it's forcing us to work with other industries. As I said at the start, that we tried to do collaborative efforts that started with the contractors and maybe the designers. And now we're starting to work with different industries that do the solar, that uh, you, for those that have swimming pool, they wanna have the heat exchangers up on the roof where they, in essence, it's a, a water solar system that they can heat their pool with. And we're starting to see that we want to orient our roof so we can have more skylights involved. We want to try and get more airflow under there or more insulation. And as we go to different parts of the country, um, we start looking at, let's take California that has 16 climatic zones that we want to look at each one of those zones and say, what are the best practices? You know, are we going to put a tile down? Are we going to raise the tile up and get more airflow through there? Are we going to put a, a, vapor barrier or an air barrier underneath the thing? Are we going to put a radiant barrier in play? Are we going to do additional insulation in there? Um, by the way, we're going to do uh, solar panels, but we've decided under the solar panel to keep it low to the deck, we're going to put asphalt shingle instead of tile. Now we've got to integrate these products together. So what we're seeing is a, a trend of homeowners, as they, as they always have, wanting the curbside appeal of when they come up to their house, it used to be you spent all your money on the inside of your house and the outside of the house was, you know, the landscape was important. But now when you look at designers and we met with a group of architects last week, they want the shock and awe feeling. They want you to pull down the street at this new subdivision and be very impressed with the complexity of the roof because the roof gives an aesthetic appearance to the house and we're going to have a lot of split levels in there and we're going to we're starting to see a lot more incorporation of different things they may do metal or copper on part of the roof and then they'll put tile so they might have tile on the main part and then as we get out over the uh, the, the big thing right now is on your front entry to do a little kick out of a small roof, covered roof area and they might do that in a different product so that they kind of get this feel of a, a slight little metal roof to it, or they might want a copper roof to it where they've got a couple pillars there. And those all make challenges for what we're trying to do. They also make challenges on how we deal with roof maintenance. You know, a lot more valley areas. Uh, now do we go closed valley, open valley? How do we keep them clean? Um, how, do, how do we know that over time, if we've got a pressure wash, are we able to do that? What does that look like? How do we build safety into it? So. The, the trends are just colors. Uh, there are colors, there are features, there's adding all of these accessories in there. 
Um, as we get into the California, Arizona, Texas, a lot of that's done on flat slab. So now all of our air conditioning ducts are in the attic. What can we do to condition the attic space better? How can we uh, get more ventilation designed into the roof? And by the way, we don't want all these roof vents sticking through our tile roof. So how do we do these as deck mounted va uh, ventilation systems? Wow. So the neat and exciting part is that as we say, there's nothing we can't tackle. So if there's um, a new trend coming or new things we want to incorporate in there, we can make that happen. You know, automated skylights, uh, we can we can work to make that happen. Um, the neat part is it's just driving a lot of innovation into the accessory lines for ventilation, for solar panels. Um, for us, we just want to figure out how we do all this so we don't end up with a roof that leaks because when it does, they don't say, gosh, I think that mount of that solar panel did, they're just going to say there's another tile roof that leaked. And so it's in our best interest to work collectively with everybody to try and come up with the best practices to meet any system, any design that people want to do. Well, Rick, that's great. And I really appreciate the time today. We're out of time, but I think what we need to do is schedule another short with you and go over some of those trends and the technology to maybe cover it from the standpoint of benefits, challenges, and solutions, because I know I know that we've got a lot of them. So uh, again, really thank you very much for being here today, and we look forward to scheduling uh, scheduling you again soon. Thank you, John, and thank everybody that we're on today. I, I hope we answered a few of the questions you had. You bet. And I will leave up this contact information and this session. We will probably carve this into individual sections, and we will have it posted on the TRI website at tileroofing.org within a couple of days. So we look forward to seeing everybody at the next short. Thank you again, uh, Rick. Thank you, John and Lisa.